Good morning and welcome. Good morning. I know that we're again still in exile, but we look forward to being in uh, sanctuary in, in time. Uh, just to let you know, today we're looking at the whole idea of um, God's grace and what it means to have uh, His grace in our lives, but not to take it for granted. So we'll hear about that in our sermon today as well as in our readings. Uh, with that said, we want to welcome all of you. Uh, there is a meeting following our late service on kind of ushers, greeters, elders, and hospitality if you want to join us for that um, following our late service. But with that said, let's rise and greet those around us with a hand of fellowship as well. begin with our opening verses. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The way of the Lord leads to eternal life. Through his death and resurrection, Jesus opens the way of eternal life. Jesus gives us the food of eternal life, his body and blood. We sing, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing.
Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Though Jesus has come down from heavens as the bread of life for us, we sometimes listen to other people's words. We sometimes choose to follow those who do not follow Jesus. We sometimes delight in earthly pleasures rather than the daily bread God has given us. Yet our Heavenly Father calls us back to Him, for His way is a way of forgiveness. Heavenly Father, we have lived according to our own wisdom and desires. We have ignored your words and wisdom. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us on the way of resurrection and eternal life on account of Jesus. Amen. Mighty God in his mercy has given his son to die and rise for you. Jesus, the living bread from heaven, has given his body and shed his blood so that you would be forgiven and have eternal life. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We are forgiven. We have eternal life in Christ. Please be seated. With our children out here, we will continue with our scripture reading. Today's Old Testament reading begins with a beautiful invitation from the Lord to the thirsty and the hungry. They are to come to him and enjoy the richest of fare all free of charge. When we hunger and thirst after the righteousness he wants to give us freely, we will never be disappointed. From Isaiah chapter 55, verses 1 through 5. Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread, and your labor on what does not satisfy. Listen, listen to me, and eat what is good, and you will delight in the richest of fare. Give ear and come to me. Listen that you may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, my faithful love promised to David. See, I have made him a witness to the peoples, a ruler and commander of the peoples. Surely you will summon nations to know not, and nations you do not know will come running to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has endowed you with splendor. This is the word of the Lord. Chapter 9 is the first of three chapters in Romans dedicated by Paul to the question of the Jews and their unbelief. In the epistle, he recounts their privileged position in God's covenant plans, reveals his own deep love and concern for his people, and sadly sadly acknowledges that many Jews were only biological children of Abraham and were not children of the promise. Romans 9, verses 1 through 13. I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my head, for I could not wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. But it is not as though the word of God has failed, for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring, but through Isaac shall your offspring offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. 
for this is what the promise said. About this time next year, I will return, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls. She was told, the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We rise for our gospel at home. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 14th chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. Today's Holy Gospel is Matthew's account of the miraculous feeding of the 5,000. His disciples must have been filled with wonder as they distribu dispersed, distributed the never failing bread and fish. Jesus still has compassion for the needy of our day world. And today he wants us to be the ones through whom he distributes his help to them from Matthew chapter 14. Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. And when he went ashore, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. Now when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the day is now over. Send the crowds away to go into the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They said to him, We have only five loaves here and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds, and they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up twelve baskets full of broken pieces left over. And those who ate were about five thousand men, besides women and children. This is the gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. We sing our sermon hymn. Thy works not mine, O Christ. Yes. Yes. Okay. The S is missing in verses two through five on the PowerPoint, I believe. I haven't had a chance to look Okay, I'm sorry. So please, everybody say can't. <laughs> okay. We believe our Savior can do it all alone. <laughs>
Good morning and welcome. Our reading for today actually comes from our Old Testament, excuse me, from our uh, epistle lesson from Paul's letter to the Romans. And as you know, we're again uh, continuing to read through Romans. And then this is what it says. Um, to them belongs the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. You know, you probably have heard that there is a lost verse of the Bible. Now, not lost in the sense of it's been hidden through the years and now we've found it, but there's the lost chapter of the Bible, as it's called, in Luke chapter 15. And there, all of the stories that are recorded from Jesus deal with lost things. There's a parable of a man who has a hundred sheep and he loses one. You're familiar with that parable, I imagine. Then there's the parable of the lost coin, whereby a woman searches her home and she finds this coin that was lost. And then there is the story of the prodigal son, the son who is lost, and he then returns home. And all of these are an allusion to the fact that God seeks what is lost and rejoices in their being found. That's why it's called the lost chapter of the Bible. And it really is given a picture in all of these parables about God's effort to save all of mankind. And God makes it his own to save his people. And doesn't that include us as well, too? We find us, he, God finds us, he makes us his own, and he rejoices in a new relationship with us. But we must also recognize that there are people who choose not to be found. There are stubbornness within humanity, and that's probably one of the great sins of humanity, our stubbornness of unbelief. God yields a call to them to come to him, and that's why God in that chapter of Luke, the 15th, seeks those things that are lost to be found. This is the situation that we find in Paul's reading today in the ninth chapter of Romans. There Paul reminds his readers that his call is to bring the gospel to his own people. And yet, in the midst of all of this, Paul is greatly concerned filled almost with grief and overcome with sorrow because his own people have not received the Messiah. They knew the Messiah was coming. They had the Old Testament in their midst. They knew that God was at work and promising a Messiah, and yet they turned their backs on the message that Paul brought to them. Just listen as the Apostle Paul reflects on this, that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart for I could wish that I myself was accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers and sisters, my kinsmen according to the flesh. Paul wished more than anything that his own people would receive Christ as their Messiah, and yet he even says that he wished that he could be cursed and cut off from God for the sake that they would receive Jesus Christ as their Messiah. It's the most poignant passage, I think, in Scripture to describe the heart of the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul is filled with grief because what he shares and those who hear it reject it. And that's why then he went to the Gentiles. Their refusal to hear the message of Jesus Christ brought him grief. I imagine that we as well, too, could identify that same grief in our own hearts, whether we're a Christian parent with a child who has drifted away from the faith, or maybe a husband and wife whose spouse seems to be indifferent to God's love, or even as a church, as we see Christians become just grieving in our hearts because they choose to not be involved in the grace of God by disassociating themselves from our church or from any church. You see, Paul's main concern for the people of Israel is that they don't misuse their spiritual privilege, that they belong to Israel. And just look what he says in the reading. Look, you were adopted through the glory. You had the covenants. You had the, given the law through Moses, the worship, the promises. 
You belong with the patriarchs, and all of these things are by the race, your race. And in Christ, God blessed the Messiah, the Christ, and yet you reject it. Is Paul reciting a litany of advantages for the people? Yes, but he's overcome with grief because his own people have entrenched themselves with stubbornness and rejected Jesus Christ. Paul understood the grief that God had in his heart, that God's people had broken the blessings. You see, the real sin that they had was their spiritual advantage became their privilege, and they then began to boast in their relationship with God and with men. And that's why Paul repeats in Romans especially that God is not the respecter of race or nationality or even gender. God chooses all to come to him. He chastised Israel. They relied on their relationship with Abraham. They thought they had great privilege before God, and yet they spurned their relationship with God. They didn't see Jesus as the Christ and the Messiah. Instead, their advantage became their stubbornness and their privilege became their sin because they boasted in their position without realizing that the position that they had was a gift of God given to them. God's plan long ago was through the nation of Israel to bring the Messiah to all nations. But their boasting and their pride got in the way. This is why Paul echoes Jesus' own words. Not everyone who calls on me, Lord, Lord, will be saved. The people of Israel failed to understand their advantage and their responsibility. They stood boasting that they were God's elect, chosen, and yet they didn't see their own blindness. You see, as Christians, we must be alert of this same thing. The temptation for us now in the new covenant is as well, too, to think that we have an especial advantage, that we can trust in Jesus, that we, like Israel, had the promise fulfilled in our midst. We, like Israel, knew God's acts. We, like Israel, look forward to the promises being fulfilled. We look to Jesus and rejoice that God's plan of salvation has come about. God's saving act of love offered to all people. But we can also be stubborn, can't we? We can consider our position a privilege and not recognize that this privilege can become a boastful, self-righteous act. We can claim ourselves to be Christians and inwardly lose our faith because we have relied on our own effort and works. You see, God seeks those things that are lost, and he recognizes that they need the mercy of Jesus Christ. Israel considered their special advantage, and we could consider our special advantage and lose sight of God's great blessing. Just listen to how the Apostle Peter now describes people of the new covenant. Peter, you may recall, was that old that saint in the early church who built upon his confession who the Christ was. But this is what he writes in his letter. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people whose possession belongs to God, that you may proclaim the excellence of him who called you out of darkness into the mar his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you receive mercy. You see, we can list our spiritual advantages. We belong to the cross, the empty tomb, eternal life, the call of discipleship, the witness to the world. All of these can become our privilege. But like Israel of old, our advantage may become a burden because we look on our own position instead of on the mercy of God. Again, Paul reflects Jesus' words. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of God, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. You see, spiritual advantages comes with responsibility to do God's will. 
To be under the grace and the greatest of blessings is to call upon our acts of stewardship of grace. We're called to share the mercy of the Lord with others. Story is told in the late 1800s, the Missouri governor issued a pardon to a convict criminal awaiting execution. The messenger that was sent went by horseback as fast as he could to the southern part of the state. As he carried the pardon papers on the highway, he was attacked once, left for dead, but yet he got up in his illness and wounds and being carrying the pardon with him. He burdened himself. As he got to the prison, the warden asked him, why did you so quickly come to de deliver the pardon? Why didn't you wait to be healed? With tears in the man's eyes, the messenger replied, sir, you don't understand. I too am a pardoned criminal. It's important that this man be pardoned as well. You see, it's with God's grace that we receive the pardon from our sins. And with this, God wants all to come to him and be pardoned as well, too. It is our privilege to share the mercy of God with others. Our world is filled with lost people, but, and Christ died for them. Every day around us, there are people who need to hear the message of Jesus Christ to be offered life eternal. And God continues through his mission to seek the lost. Certainly, it grieves him when those don't want to be found, turn their back. But it also is responsibility that we accept in our faithful mission of Jesus Christ. The blessings of God, like everything else in life, can be used and abused. But when we enjoy the gift of God's grace and make it a part of our life to tell others of it, we find that our privilege becomes a joy. May we not share in the same temptation of considering our privilege and not recognizing the mercy that God abounds in our life. And may the grace of God abound in our life as we accept with responsibility the joy of telling people about his grace. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, Keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We rise. In our prayers today, we want to pray especially for the Kalmbach family at the passing of uh, their daughter. We also want to pray, too, for, for others, and especially for Melanie Bullock. Melanie had a stroke um, and is in the hospital, and we want to Pray for her as she goes through recovery. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you with all the blessings that you bestow upon us. But it's easy, Lord, for us to take a place of privilege and never recognize that your call is for all people. Help us, Lord, to live out our lives in this age, an age that seems to grow distant from you, but now needs more than ever your grace and mercy. Lord, we pray for the church on earth that you would strengthen its witness. We pray for our own congregation, Lord, that you would strengthen our witness in our community. We pray for the churches of the community that they would bring God's word to people. We pray, Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Father, we thank you for this nation and for all the nations of the world. We pray that you would work toward peace through those that lead. Above all, Lord, we ask that you would bring peace in Europe and that you would help the war to end. We pray, Lord, for those that struggle and suffer amidst many ills. Above all, we pray for our own congregation, for those that are struggling with health issues. We pray for Melanie Bullock, Lord, and ask that you give her strength as she tries to recover from a stroke. We pray, Lord, for her family and her mother and all those that care for her. Above all, Lord, we pray that you'd also be with the Kalmbach family and give strength to them. We recognize, Lord, your care and your call, and we ask now that you be with those here today that are struggling with health issues to give them strength, but also be with those that have recovered. Lord, you bless us with many things, and one thing you give to us is a sureness of your promises. May we hold to your promises that you are a God who cares. We pray, Lord, for uh, students and teachers who will return to school in, in the next few weeks, and we ask, O oh Lord, that you give strength to them. Be with families and parents as they begin a new school year. May they use their gifts for learning. We pray for the leaders of our congregation 
and helping us work toward recovering our sanctuary back to, to its function. We ask all of these things, Lord. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, we will take our offerings and our tithes to the Lord. rise and we'll sing together and receive these offers. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and proper that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, and everlasting God. As your children, you have given us a perfect love to see your Son, Jesus Christ, in his humble birth, perfect life, sacrificial death, and glorious resurrection by which you give us the forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you in the same. Jesus Christ, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. And also after supper, he also took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Take and drink. This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed also for you for the remission of sins. This do also in remembrance of me. As often as we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you.
have a uh, first area that comes up for communion is this, those that are sitting here in front and will rotate this way. And then we'll have this side over here then come through and rotate this way. And then we'll have the last section come through and rotate that way. It's easier for us to do this.
We sing together. pray. Almighty Father, your patience toward us is great and your love is without limit. Grant to us grace that we, by the forgiveness of our sins, be kept holy and pure to the day of Christ's coming again, when we shall stand before the judgment seat on high. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Our sending song, I am trusting the Lord Jesus. Please be seated. Again, we want to thank all of you for being here this morning. And um, if the sermon or even the liturgy or any of the things here today prompted any of your thinking or of your own question of faith, please uh, speak with me uh, following the service or at another time. Again, we want to invite you to a, uh, I call it a hospitality kind of training for our congregation. Um, if you're an usher greeter or just somebody who wants to be involved in learning more about how our church can uh, participate in hospitality when people come to visit. Um, I'd like to uh, invite you to a training following our meal, uh, excuse me, following our late service. So with that said, uh, have a wonderful day. Yes? Uh, just our answering machine isn't working in the office, so 
So oh. if you tried reaching us, it's, we don't know what's wrong. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. We're, we're, if, yeah, we need to get a new answering machine. So if we're, we haven't picked up the phone, we're sorry about that. So <laughs> we're trying. So, all right, with that said, thank you all for being here today. And uh, we're invited to stay for Bible class as well, too. Today we're looking at the feeding of the 5,000. Thank <laughs> you.